Many people speak and give you give their opinions, but they really did not know nothing about football. The only team that won the champions was Saudi Arabia. Don't forget that. And to be honest, I'm really don't worry about what the people say. This contract is unique because I'm a unique player as well. So for me, it's normal. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really delighted and excited to welcome you all to this historic event. The unveiling of the Portuguese star and the world's greatest footballer, Cristiano Ronaldo, as a Nasser player here at Marsoul Park, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Cristiano. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes. <laughs> Announcing this historic transfer, your new club stated this is history in the making. This is a signing that will not only inspire our club to achieve even greater success, but inspire our league, our nation, and future generations, boys and girls, to be the best version of themselves. Cristiano Benfento, Arabia Saudita, welcome to Saudi Arabia, you. your new home, and to Anasar, your new team. You. So you conquered Europe. Now a fresh new start in Asia. How does it feel to be here in Saudi Arabia? Well, so far feeling very good. I'm so proud to make this big decision in my, in my life and football. As you mentioned before, in Europe, my work, it's done. I, I won everything. I played in the most important clubs in Europe. And for me now is a new a challenge, as you mentioned, in Asia. I'm glad for that uh, Al Nasser gave me this opportunity to to show and develop not only for the for the football, but also for the generation, the young generation, the women's generation as well, for the young boys. And for me, it's it's a challenge, but in the same way, it's, I feel very very happy and very proud. Definitely and absolutely ready. What excites you and also your family who are here already with you about your new future in Saudi Arabia? Uh, they are happy as well. You know, I, when I take the, my decisions, my family, they always support me, especially my kids. <laughs> and my God bless them as well. But it's good. They are very happy. The welcome yesterday was amazing. We feel good here. Saudi Arabia people, they are lovely with me and with my family. So. I'm really proud. You already felt it. Well, Cristiano, you have always been ambitious. What are you hoping to achieve on and off the pitch in Saudi Arabia? As I told you before, for me, this is a great opportunity, not only in football, but also to change the mentality um, of the new generation. As nobody know, but I can say now I had many opportunities in Europe, many clubs, in, in, um, in Brazil, uh, in Australia, US, even in Portugal, many clubs tried to, to sign me, but I give the word to this club for the opportunity to de develop uh, not only the football, but the other part of this amazing country. And for me, it's a good challenge. I know what I want and I know, of course, what I don't want as well. So always a good chance to change, to help with my knowledge and my experience, to help to grow many, many important points. Also, a woman's that many people probably don't know, but Al Nassar, they have a woman's football as well. And I want to give a different vision um, of the country, of the football, the perspective of everybody. So this is why I took this opportunity. Amazing respect. <laughs> Frankly speaking, did Saudi performance at the World Cup and the fact that all the players are in SPL really helped in convincing you doing the move and joining Saudi football? Many people speak and give you give their opinions, but they really did not know nothing about football. As you know, the football now, probably the last 10, 15 years, they are different. All the teams, they are more prepared. 
all the teams they are ready. If you see and you give the example of World Cup, the only team that won the champions was Saudi Arabia. Don't forget that. Yes. And you had many surprises. South Korea, for example, the African teams, Costa Rica, for example, they did a good job. It's not easy to win any games today because the teams they are prepared, the football it's different, the evolution of football is different. So for me it's not it's not the end of my career to come in South Africa. This is why I wanna change. And to be honest, I'm really don't worry about what the people say. Uh, I took my decisions and I and I have responsibility to to change that. But for me it's it's I'm really, really happy to be here. And uh, I know the league is very competitive. The people don't know that as well, but I know because I saw many games. And um, you know, what I want and I'm looking forward to it's it's to play. And I hope to play after tomorrow if the coach is <laughs> is a good uh, change uh, chase. But I'm you know, I'm ready to enjoy it to to still play football and enjoy the people. Ooh. We're really excited to see you on the pitch as well. Sure. Well one thing we all agree on this. This is a unique signing. But some people have criticized your move here. I know you don't care, as you just mentioned, but I want your thoughts on this. I'm a unique player, so it's good to come in here. I beat the all records there, so I'm going to beat a few records here as well. So for me, it's a, it's a good chance, as you say, this contract is unique because I'm a unique player as well. So for me, it's normal. <laughs> Great. What is your message to all your fans in Saudi and around the world from here? It's simple. I'm coming here to win, to play, to enjoy, to be part of the successful of the the country and the culture of the the culture of the country. And I'm here all together with Al Nassar, with the, with my coach, with my president, and they all the all people from Al Nassar. And what I want is to enjoy, to smile, and uh, play football. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Cristiano. And ladies and gentlemen, um, another round of applause to our great player and star, Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> to you, Coach uh, Rodi. How are you? Very happy. <laughs> uh, I can see that. <laughs> I can see the huge smile. <laughs> For sure. Well, Coach Rudy, you managed hundreds of players in your managerial uh, career. How do you think working with the world's best player would add to your team? First of all, uh... I'm very surprised about uh, a lot of people in the press conference today. Of course. Normally, normally after the game, there is three, four journalists. <laughs> today, I don't know why. There is. This is a new era. This is a new era. <laughs> so, please, every game, everyone is welcome to come after the, after the game to speak about uh, right. Cristiano's, Cristiano's goal. Uh, no, uh, Cristiano is one of the best players in the world, in the story of the football. He's a legend, so it's an honor for sure for me, but also for Al Nasser to welcome uh, Cristiano. We are here to win, nothing else. Great. You once said you want to coach Ronaldo. Here he is, right next to you. Yes, we will have time to speak uh, about a lot of things, but uh, about the most important thing and the most important thing is here. Is green and we we need to train and we need to win and we need to to play here. Absolutely. How do you see him, Cristiano, impacting uh, football beyond just Al Nasser, but also on the league and the wider region? Yeah, he's an example. Uh, everyone knows that. So my goal, my object, my objective for Cristiano is uh, make him happy. And uh, I want him to enjoy playing with Al Nassar and uh, winning with Al Nassar. Just that. Yeah, it's all about enjoying through that. Thank you, thank you, Rudy. Wishing you, Ronaldo, and the rest of the team great success in the future. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come. 
we have come to our end of this session. Cristiano will now make his way to the dressing room to get ready for his big moment, the unveiling in a Nasser kit for the very first time. Thank you all for joining us in this special and historic occasion. There are people all around, there are cars parked all around, there are people on the street. You look ahead, there are thousands of people. You look behind, there's thousands of people. And everybody had a smile on their face. None of them were sitting in the car. All of them were outside. Here's the thing, I'm sure you've noticed this, that every time you come for an event, there's a standing ovation like this. It's, um, you are referred to very often as a, as a legend. How does that feel? That's a priceless feeling in itself, isn't it? Well, it feels very old to start off <clears throat> because uh, to be called a legend, first of all, I don't believe I'm a legend, uh, but to be called a legend, which means you have spent a lot of time on the field, on the field, whether, depending on whichever stream you come from, whether you are from Bollywood, whether you're from cricket or any other sport or business, banking, any sector. There's a survey where the results revealed that you are the second most admired man in India. Talia Ujai. That is a big deal. Second, second to whom? Second to our Prime Minister. Well, I think uh, I can stand in the election now. I think if I ever want to get into politics, I'll have to really study a lot, you know, do a lot of changes and, you know, then maybe I'll be able to adapt. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a big thing to be admired by so many people. And, you know, thanks to cricket, if I was not playing cricket, don't, I don't think, you know, there'll be so many people who would be admiring me. And a lot of times uh, people say, oh, you are very lucky. You know, I love when people say that. And I just tell them, you know, it's not like I am lucky, it's just that the number of people I meet and the connect that I have with the people, they are the ones who pray for me. You know, and that's why I'm so lucky. It's not like, you know, I, I was born lucky, but over the years it has happened that, you know, Whenever there's a 50-50 scenario, more often than not, you know, it turns in, in the favor of us, you know, whether it's me as an individual or as a team. So, you know, being lucky is important, but at the same time, I think uh, the admiration and uh, it's something, you know, uh, you, know you, you feel a lot more satisfied looking at, you know, the kind of ovation you get wherever you go and the kind of love and affection that people show towards you. We'll talk about luck in just a minute, but I'm going to make a prediction here. It's, it is going to happen. I see it. MS Dhoni, Prime Minister of the country, couple of years from now, that is a possibility. I really believe. I really believe. And then when this happens, you said Mandira Bedi predicted it, okay? Sitting on stage talking to Dhoni. But I think that's more pressure than, you know, uh, trying to win a World Cup. You don't take pressure. Imagine, imagine, especially with the banking sector and everyone, oh, the GDP is going down, you know, the financial deficit is happening, <laughs> export, import, all that thing. We are a big country. The number of people that in itself is a big challenge. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, local trains or buses or roads. We are just too big and it will take time, you know, for we'll us to uh, become what some of the other countries are. But I always felt till your intention is right and you're moving forward thinking that this is what is good for the country or the state, you know, it, that is the right decision. Uh, we've seen a World Cup win, we've seen a T20 World Cup win, we've seen India uh, at number one, ranked at number one for 18 months in the test format. So you've given our country many, many, many priceless moments. A big round of applause for that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. But what would you say is your priceless moment as far as your, the cricketing career is concerned? A, as captain and B, as player. Well, the answer would be very different. You know, a lot of people would be expecting, okay, this is something that he would pick, that is something that he would pick. But uh, the two special moments, uh, first I would say it was just after the 2007 T20 World Cup, we landed in Mumbai. So for a lot of us, we were part of the team that went to England. And from England, we got selected and we went to South Africa for the T20 World Cup. 
So if one, we were coming back and that day it was very cloudy and you know, it was raining. So it, we started our descent, we were about to land and I look outside, I'm like, you know what, it's raining, there would be nobody to receive us. We shall book all our flights and we'll go back to our respective cities because we have been out for so long. So we land and even before immigration, there were like loads of people to receive us. And I still remember, we were in a double decker bus. It was I an open top no bus. No one can forget that experience. Raining, cloudy. Yes, and it took us literally five hours from the airport to the Wankhede Stadium. We all got wet. We were in the bus. We dried up somehow. We again got wet because in between again it was raining. So it happened like twice or thrice. And then the most memorable moment came. So what is called the queen's necklace? We are right in the center. There are people all around. There are cars parked all around. There are people on the street. You look ahead, there are thousands of people. You look behind, there's thousands of people. And everybody had a smile on their face. None of them were sitting in the car. All of them were outside. They were having their cameras. They had that smile. They were clicking pictures. I don't know how many of them actually missed their flights or were very late for work. It was not late, it would have been very late for work, but that's, that's what it meant to them. You know, we were thinking, okay, we'll go back home. And then the kind of response we got, and also we don't really have anything to compare it to. Because 2011 we won, but there was no celebration like that. Like this. Because we never went out, nothing really happened. Even the time when we won, we were in the stadium till 1, 1 1.30. And we actually, like, I personally actually didn't see the people celebrate on the street. Whatever we saw was on television. So, you know, that was a very memorable moment. The second would be, it was during the 2011 World Cup. It was during the finals. We were uh, sitting in, uh, not sitting, we were playing at Wangkhe. And it was like 10 or 15 runs were needed. And me and Yuvraj, we were batting. And all of a sudden, the crowd, they start singing the song, Vande Matram. Oh, my and, God, that gives me goose flesh. The and you're of it. right in the middle, and imagine 35, 40,000 people, you know, saying Vande Matram. And so it used to start from, let's say, if it started from North Stand, your ears actually move because it goes around. So that would be my second most memorable moment, or one or two, you know, I can't really stack it saying this was the preferred moment, but it was something that was very, very special. And I don't know if I would ever be able to witness something like that, because you may have 40,000 people uh, singing the national anthem or singing the national song, but that atmosphere, the, the moment, uh, the hard work that was put for that 45, 50 days, you know, during the World Cup, whether it will come or not, you know, so uh, I feel these are the two priceless moments uh, when it comes to my cricketing career. And there have been lots of other moments, but uh, these two, I think, were very, very priceless, you know, to me. What advice would you give a youngster today who's getting into, um, into cricket or sport, any kind of competitive sport, maybe? The youngsters today, the only piece of advice uh, I would give them, which was very relevant when I made my debut or people in the 80s played, Cricket is the core. You take care of cricket. Everything else will Thanks take care. care of itself. So this is you. Your social media, I follow you on Instagram, is, has got a lot, lots of videos and lots of images of your beautiful little daughter. Tell us or share with us a, one of the most priceless moments that you, you've had with her. Uh, I think the most priceless moment was after the World Cup, when we came back uh, and Sakshi and Ziva, they were still in Delhi at that point of time, Gurgaon. And the first time I saw her, I picked her up and she must be two months or one and a half months. And she made a lot of noise. That was the first time she was seeing me. I don't know whether she saw me or not because they say as a, as a kid who's one month, two months, they don't, they can't really the, see long. Yeah, their vision isn't developed. But for the full five minutes, she was making noise, she was giggling and she was like, she has never done it. I don't know why she's doing it. She even had problem with that. Why is she doing it? <laughs> why she never First you were not it there. Now yes. she's come. Why is she responding to you like this? Yeah, so <laughs> I think that was a priceless moment because whatever said and done, that 
first time when you see your newborn, you know, something happens which is very difficult to describe in word. And from that till now, she's four and a half and every, every time she comes in and she has a, a new question or answer and the latest is, uh, you know, when, when you ask Lee, okay, why do you love Papa? Ah, oh, Papa is money. Oh, wow. I don't know who taught her, but <laughs> she's straightforward. She's like, why do you love Papa? Oh, because Papa is money. <laughs> that priceless moment that gave you your first grey hair. Do you remember it? <laughs> I think it started very early in our career, you know, because every game that you play when it comes to cricket, it may be your last game. You know, so like my fifth game was almost my last game. People say different things about it, but I had not scored in the first four games. The fifth game, after the game, there was a selection meeting that was held. So there's 99% chances coming from Bihar, Jharkhand, which was not very well known uh, for cricket. If I had not scored in that game, I think 90% I would have been kicked out of the team, which people say no, no. That's they where have. your first grey hair came. I think Probably. so. Probably. Yeah. I think it's a good thing to have or get grey hair because it shows that you think about certain things in life, you do get stressed about things in life. But the amount of grey hair and beard that I've got, uh, I think if I don't colour my hair, I'll be like Amitabh Bachchan, that's how grey I am, you know, so… Really? Yes, at 39… See, that's one secret that he's just shared with us. No, See, this I have shared with a lot of people. You have? Big round of applause. MS Dhoni, always straight from the heart. We are a country of 1.4 billion people. We have more than 800 channels. We have a lot of content. And our phone is full of stories and videos and reels and all sorts of things that you all consume. But we seek validation from the foreign press. We may trash it, we may say that we don't care about what the New York Times is saying, but we do, because we discuss it. It affects us, we react to it, we consume it. Promise I'll keep it short, I don't have a teleprompter anyway, so. Let me start by thanking the Rashtriya Patrakarita Kalyan Nyas for this award. Let me also congratulate them for all the good work that they're doing to promote journalism in India. I think this award and this recognition today is for my team and my channel and for the journalism that, they, that we do and for the purpose that we hope we serve. What is the purpose, we ask ourselves. I think uh, what we set out to do was to tell India's story in India's words. Uh, the show I do, it's called Gravitas, and the tagline is making sense of the news. But essentially, we're trying to make sense of the world through India's perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, I've said this in the past, and I say it again, and I believe this, that our world today is a grand storytelling competition. We're all striving to present our national, cultural, personal, all kinds of stories in the most persuasive manner. I remember reading somewhere in the olden times, they used to say that if you want to poison a people, you should poison their wells. You know, they'll have contaminated water, they'll die. Now it is said that if you want to poison a people, you poison their stories. When you poison their stories, you contaminate their minds. And it's, it's worse than dropping bombs. Because then you take away the self-confidence of a country. You devastate their morale. And I think that is more damaging any day than poisoning water or poisoning wells. You make a country doubt its abilities. And we Indians have been through a very difficult phase where we were colonized, and while we achieved independence 75 years ago, I think somewhere a lot of us are still colonized in our minds. We need to come out of that. So it is important to tell stories and tell the right stories in the right manner because stories sway people. They change the course of policies, politics, and indeed the world. And this is my favorite example from the Second World War. 
America had a list of cities in Japan that they wanted to bomb with the atom bomb. And on that list was the city of Kyoto. But the US then had a secretary of war, and he decided that Kyoto should not be part of the list. We know which two cities were bombed eventually, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He removed Kyoto because this secretary of war in America had been to Kyoto on his honeymoon, and he saw how beautiful Kyoto is and how rich it is culturally, and he believed that that culture should not be destroyed. So the story of Kyoto won, and the story of Nagasaki and Hiroshima lost, which is why it is very important to also control your story, to actively shape it. We are a country of 1.4 billion people. We have more than 800 channels. We have a lot of content, and our phone is full of stories and videos and reels and all sorts of things that you all consume. We are a very aware and politically engaged people from the tea seller to the CEO of a company. Everybody knows what's happening. They can talk to you about Biden's policies, and they can also weigh in on what's happening in Bihar and everything in between. But we seek validation from the foreign press. If you've seen what's been making news in the past couple of days, you would know. The New York Times writes something about a policy in India, and it immediately becomes a Twitter trend. But why do we need a certificate from the foreign press? We may trash it. We may say that we don't care about what the New York Times is saying, but we do, because we discuss it. It affects us. We react to it. We consume it. The Economist says something about who we should vote for in an Indian election, and it becomes part of the political debate. And while we've achieved a lot in India in the last 75 years, we've not had a single newspaper in this country. Can you imagine an Indian newspaper publishing a headline about something in the US or the UK, and for that, making, making it to the big political story of that country? Will American leaders debate what is written in the Indian Express? Will British leaders debate what's written in the Times of India? They're not affected by what we are saying, but we are affected by what they say about us. If there's disturbance in Kashmir, the BBC reports it, the Al Jazeera reports it. And you, they use their own lens, their own editorial biases, and all media is agenda-driven. I was discussing it with someone earlier today. India's first newspaper, um, Hickey's Gazette, was a very anti-imperial newspaper. It had an agenda, it took sides. Media take sides, and that is okay. The argument I'm making is very simple. We are a land of epics like the Mahabharata and Ramayana, and yet we've allowed others to take control of our story for way too long. And that is what we try, try to do at Vion still. I started with talking about our purpose, and that is our purpose, to, to tell India's story. And we found a willing and a very welcoming audience in all of you, and a lot of Indians, I'm very happy to share with you that only 40% of our audience and our viewers are in India. The remaining 60% are outside India, which gives us a lot of hope. <laughs> that in Europe, in Africa, in America, in Southeast Asia, there is an audience that wants to listen to India's perspective on what's happening in the world, that wants to know what India feels about global developments. And it's only time for a country that is ready to assume its role as a global leader to have a voice like that. When we began this journey in Beyond five years back, we are a young channel. Uh, we believed in the product. We believed what we were trying to do. But we never imagined that in so short a time, we'll get the kind of response that we, did, that we do now. I was in Ukraine earlier this year, and people saw the mic, and there were some Indians, and they walked up to us and they said, this is channel. Hai. And that gives us a lot of, lot of encouragement to do more of what we are doing. The numbers encourage both me and my team, and awards like these, thank you very much, also inspire us to do better every day.
So on behalf of my, my team at Rion, I want to once again thank you for the award. Thank you very much. Life is not a bed of roses. Life is going to be tough. Life is going to have challenges along the way. And as long as you are willing to face that, as long as you make yourself capable of you know, facing that, that will determine whether you are going to be the winner or you're going to be the loser. Good afternoon to everyone. You know, I'm truly delighted to be here amongst you. And I, I really mean this. Uh, you know, besides my passion for cinema and traveling, what I love most is to be with young people like you, to interact, to interact, to understand. Because I truly believe that the youth are the pulse of today, the present. You are the vibrant force of today. What you think, what you aspire, what you dream, the way you conduct yourself, the way you carry yourself, will not only determine the society of tomorrow or the country of tomorrow, or for that matter, the world of tomorrow, but you also play a very vital role in the present. That is my firm belief. What you do, what you think, what kind of taste you have, what kind of outlook you have, what kind of mannerism you have, makes the dynamism of today, of the present as well. That kind of power you guys have. What you choose will make a lot of difference. What you choose to eat, what you choose to drink, what you choose to wear, what kind of entertainment you choose to have, what are the kind of things that you like or dislike determines the dynamism not only in the society, but also in the marketplace. If youth of today, if you decide, someone who is about 15 to 16 to up to 30, if they decide not to drink certain types of soft drinks, the market of that soft drink will plummet. If you decide that you are not entertained by certain types of entertainment, if you feel going to the movie theaters and watching movies does not give you entertainment, the movie business will go down. If you ch choose to dislike certain types of clothes, certain types of mannerism, the same thing will happen to that as well. That is the kind of power that you guys have. But I am not sure whether the youth of today are aware of that power or whether they are utilizing their power on their own. Because I believe, you know, in today's age, in the information age, in the cyber age, other sources are making decisions for you. Other factors are directing you to do what you're supposed to do. What kind of fun you should have, what kind of food you should enjoy, what kind of entertainment you should have, what kind of clothing you should wear, what kind of gadgets you should own. That is the thing that you should be deciding. But what happens is in this information age, in the digital age, and the cyber age, other sources are deciding for you. So more or less, that power has been snatched away from you. Because probably because the youth of today is not aware of that power. Now what happens is when someone else is directing you of all these things, the society becomes a one big herd. There's a danger of creating a herd, a sheep-like community where everybody thinks alike, where everybody wants to wear the same thing, where everybody wants to have something that the other person has, and they do not make their own individual decision. They are giving away their individual power, and that is what you guys should be reclaiming now. You know, it's all right to be similar, but it is much more better to be different, to have your own individual opinion, to have your own individual taste, to have your own individual creativity, and to be directed by that and to be motivated by that gives you a true personality, gives you a true identity. So this is what I really want to tell the youth of today is reclaim that power that you guys have, your individuality, your personality, you know, the thing that you are capable of your own own. Because now I see you here, you know, gathered. I can either look at you as a 
bunch of students, or I can look at you as individuals. If I look at you as a bunch of students, I will just see similar things, similarities, same age, same reaction, same kind of thought process. But if I look at you individually, each of you have something to offer. Each of you have certain types of skills and talents that you can bring into the table. And you should be recognizing that and you should be utilizing that. Because I'm not saying that all of you are equal. But what I'm saying is each one of you are different. And cash on that. Utilize that. Don't compare yourself to others. Don't go by what the trend is saying. Don't go by with all the information that you have been bombarded with that is the right way to do things or think things. Don't go by that. Be your own creation. Utilize your creativity. Because each of you are an individual. Each of you have different types of skills, different types of talents, different types of capability. All you have to do is recognize that, to pinpoint that. You know? Some of you might be good in, in, in the future. Some, might, some of you might be a great CEO. Some of you might be a great chef. It doesn't matter. As long as you are utilizing your skill, as long as you're utilizing your capability. Because, you know, in long run, when you go into life tomorrow, you at this stage, probably all of you have certain goals, you know, the goals that you want to achieve. You're probably saying that I want to excel in this, I want to become this, I want to become a great banker maybe, I want to great, become a great CEO in the future maybe. And you make a certain goals for yourself. But let me tell you, Goal is not the end by itself. What you think as a goal is only the means. What you should actually aspire for is the growth in you. And the growth happens on an everyday basis. How to grow better, how to be a better person, how to achieve better things, so that ultimately one day you'll be in your goals. Once you have put your goals in place, According to the capacity and capability that you have, on a day-to-day -day basis, what you should concentrate on is how to grow better. Forget about your goal. As long as you're growing better each day, as long as you're learning each day, as long as you're being a better person each day, ultimately, if you get the goal, you become a very, very capable person. And even if you don't get the goal, what happens is that you will not be empty-handed you would have been, become a better person and you will end up doing something or the other. So the idea is the growth. Because in, in life, science says that whatever comes in life ultimately degenerates, you know, ultimately dies away, ultimately fades away. You know, you're born, you grow, you reach a certain peak, and then your decline starts, and then you meet your end. Everything happens like that in the nature, in the living beings, you know, you're born, you blossom, and then you die. But the only thing that remains with you throughout your life, which you can grow it constantly, is your knowledge, your spirit. That you can make it grow all your life. Even if your body gives up, even if you are weak and feeble in your old age, as long as you are constantly growing in your mind and in your spirit, you are becoming fruitful. So that is the only thing that keeps on growing for the entire life of yours, unless if you are attacked by some terrible disease of the mind. As long as that is not happening, that is the only thing that grows constantly. Otherwise, everything else degenerates. Today, you are young people. You have not peaked yet. At certain age, you will be peaking. And then once you peak, you will reach your saturation points. And then the downhill starts. And then the, you know, the course of the nature takes place. But that doesn't mean that spiritually and mentally that you will not be growing. As long as your mind is functioning, you will be growing all your life. So that is what you should be concentrating and focusing on. To growth, to grow yourself mentally. You know, there is a story of this uh, great writer. And this writer says, you know, at one stage of his life, a disease, a fatal, very uh, dangerous disease hits him and his body becomes very, very weak and he degenerates. So his whole body is not functioning, but his mind is still functioning. 
And even at that stage, because his mind is functioning, he's willing to grow all the time. He's willing to lift up his spirit all the time. And then what he wrote at that stage was, he says, my hands are weak because he's a sick person. He's an old person. He says, my hands are weak, but my writing is strong. He says, I have lost my speech, but my voice is strong. He says, I have diminished, but then he says, I have grown at the same time. So that is what happens. As long as you're concentrating on becoming a better person, growing all the time, that will you know, complete you as a human being, and that will be by your side all your life. So that is what you should concentrate on. As long as you're growing, there's no doubt that if you have known your capacity and your capability and if you have set a goal, you will definitely reach a goal. And once you have reached a goal, once you've become whatever you wanted to become, you know, whether you wanted to become a CEO, a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, or for that matter, an actor, in long run, what happens is, in the society, what is most important is, it's not what you do. What you do is not important. A lot of people concentrate on what they are doing, you know? They're saying, you know what I do? I'm a doctor. You know what I do? I'm a businessman. You know what I do? I'm a politician. Most of the people concentrate on what I do. But the emphasis should be on why I do what I'm doing. If you're able to get that message across of why you are doing what you are doing, the society respects you even more. They admire you even more, and your achievement becomes a true achievement. If you are able to explain why you are doing what you are doing, you know, if a doctor is, a, is able to explain why he has become a doctor, what is the reason he has become a doctor? What kind of contribution he wants to make to, make to the society? If a politician, instead of concentrating on what he is, if he constant, concentrates on why what, why is he what he is, then the society respects him more. He will be able to clarify why he wants to be a politician. What are the reasons he wants to be the politician? If he can get that message across, the society will accept him and respect him even more. And for that matter, even an actor. If I keep on saying that I'm an actor, what I do, I'm an actor, what are you? I'm a superstar. If I only say that, and if I'm not able to disseminate the message of why I'm doing what I'm doing, why am I contributing all my years in an acting field? Why did I start my, my acting career? What was the reason why I wanted to be an actor? If I'm able to put that message across to the society, the respect and the acceptance comes much more easily. So don't concentrate on what you want to become. You know, try to find out an answer why you want to become whatever you want to become. What is the reason? Why is it that you want to be whatever you want to be? You know, ask yourself. And for that, you need a certain type of awareness. You know, awareness is the most important thing. When I'm saying awareness is the most important thing is because, you know, as a human being, we are more or less made in the same fashion, in the same manner. After all, we're all humans. You know, we have similar emotions, whether we are a great scientist or we are an ordinary person, you know, we have similar emotions, we have similar mechanism, we react to similar things. But if you are aware, the people who are aware, they get the same actions done to them, but the people who are aware, they react differently. If someone makes you angry, if you are not aware of your emotions, you intend to get angry and, 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 you know, retaliate. But if you're aware of your emotions, you know, that might give you a realization that how am I going to control my actions? How am I going to, you know, behave in this manner? So awareness is very, very important. You know, having emotions is not a big deal. Don't try to say that I'm a good person. I don't get angry. I don't like to and I do this or do that, I'm a very nice person. Don't say that, because we're all affected by the human emotions. We're all affected by anger. We're all affected by love. We're all affected by disappointments. We're all affected by success in the same manner. But it is the people who are aware, they channelize it differently. You know, we come to know how to channelize our emotions, 
And that becomes very, very important. And I think a person who is aware will be able to, you know, determine its, its future and its future path in a more accurate way. People can take away your money, people can take away your clothing, people can take away your possessions, but what they cannot take away is how you react to a situation. How are you going to react to a situation is going to be with you and that is going to be your power. If some people teases you, it is within your power how you're going to react. That power, nobody is going to snatch it away. If somebody says, I'm going to kill you, how you're going to react to that is your power. That power, no one can steal away from you. If somebody comes to your house and robs everything, how you're going to react to that situation is up to you. So the person who knows how to react in a situation is the person who is finally going to reach his destination. And I think that is very, very important. But at the same time, you know, I'm not going to say that by doing everything correctly, by having your goals, by being aware, by being a determined person, you know, by re recognizing one's power and responsibility, life is going to be easy. I'm not going to say that. Nobody said life is going to be easy. Life is not a bed of roses. Life is going to be tough. Life is going to have challenges along the way. Life will always have challenges and hurdles. And they will be there at every interval. Don't think that just because you have gone through one challenge that you have succeeded in life. Just because you have reached a successful point at one phase of your life, don't think that your entire life is successful. Until you live, you will have to achieve a lot of success. You'll have to face a lot of challenges. You'll have to face a lot of hurdles. And as long as you are willing to face that, as long as you make yourself capable of you know, facing that, that will determine whether you are going to be the winner or you're going to be the loser. Because in life, no matter what happens, you know, winning is important. To win is important. But not winning by hook or by crook. Not winning by any means, but by winning in an honest way. You know, winning by helping other people, being compassionate to other people. When you are getting to the winning position, helping other people along the way as well. And despite that, if you actually become a winner tomorrow, everybody will appreciate that. Everybody will consider you as a true winner because you have gone there by your honest means, by helping other people, by being compassionate to other people, and not by hook or by crook. So I ask you all to be a winner in life, be a winner in a very honest way, in a compassionate way, protect your individuality, and have a wonderful life. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Nobody has ever achieved anything big in business or in any walk of life without courage. Of course, whenever you do anything big, you do feel a little scared. But you've got to conquer fear to discover the hidden hero within you. My dearest Reliance family, once again, a very warm good evening to each and every one of you. Over the last 40 years, I have been very fortunate to lead Reliance. Everything I am today is because of Reliance. Everything I know today is thanks to Reliance. This evening, I want to share with you the most important lessons I have learned from my father during this phenomenal journey. The first lesson is courage. And I have seen it in a whole lot of you. Nobody has ever achieved anything big in business or in any walk of life without courage. Of course, whenever you do anything big, you do feel a little scared. But you've got to conquer fear to discover the hidden hero within you. With courage, 
with self belief and the can do spirit you overcome any adversity therefore i want today's young leaders at reliance to realize that achieving your potential is the quest of the ordinary conquering the impossible is your destiny the second lesson i have learned is feel empathy empathy means caring and sharing with every human being in our organization and the world at large the more we care the higher we grow as human beings i understand empathy as dil ki daulat it is the wealth of your heart the more you spend it on others the more wealthy you become the third lesson i have learned is to have absolute faith in technology and talent in every business we have started we have always embraced the latest technology and have attracted the best talent when top technology and talent work together they produce unbeatable creativity innovation and invention like my father i value trust loyalty and a direct heart to heart relationship as we enter reliance's golden decade i want to commend these learnings to the next generation of reliance the future of reliance belongs to you today you have a fabulous platform that will enable you to achieve multiples of what has been achieved by my generation friends today reliance is a global leader in energy and materials where operating safely is an obsession and with geo and retail where we have established leadership position in india we are customer obsessed as we enter our golden decade we at reliance are in a unique position to accomplish what very few companies in the world can even dream of and i have no doubt that the next generation of reliance will make it a reality okay, yes we can and we will yes we can and we will so let me say first can reliance be amongst the top 20 companies in the world yes we can and we will second i believe that in the coming decades the world will transition from fossil fuels to clean green and renewable energy can reliance become a leading power of clean and affordable energy to india yes we can and we will third i believe that the world will invent new materials that will revolutionize how we manufacture and produce things and improve the quality of life of every human being can reliance be a leading global producer of these innovative new materials yes we can and we will fourth geo has the opportunity to digitally reinvent with artificial intelligence and blockchain all sectors of the indian economy whether it is entertainment financial services commerce manufacturing agriculture education or healthcare can geo be the first company to transform an entire nation in each one of these sectors yes we can and we will fifth and finally Reliance has an opportunity to be an even stronger partner to our nation. Can Reliance and Jio partner and empower all Indians, our fellow citizens, small businesses and merchants and enterprises so India can become a global superpower? Can Reliance do that? 
Yes, we can and we will. My Reliance family, looking at the sea of lights in front of me and looking at your energy, optimism and self-confidence, I am assured that the future of Reliance is in good hands. And this institution that we love and cherish will rise to even greater heights in the decades to come. I am thankful to each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart for your hard work, commitment and dedication to the mission of Reliance. It is because of each one of you that we are who we are today. I wish and I pray may good luck and fortune shine on each and every one of you and on Reliance. And may every day be even more fulfilling and rewarding for all of us. My mother Kokila Bin, Nita, Isha, Akash and Anand join me in wishing you and your families a very happy and prosperous 2018. All the very best, good luck, God bless and thank you very much for everything. Visit our site, EnglishSpeechChannel.com for exclusive access to video transcripts, offline audio, English lessons, and private classes. Don't forget to explore our free and new ebooks. Also, subscribe to our weekly newsletter for the latest updates. Links in the description below. Thanks for your support.